have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours and ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. For thou will be us, strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
A reading from the first letter of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a birth into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Was not with them when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, through believing in him, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus narrative found in chapter 20 of St. John's Gospel is so beautifully crafted to draw us into the living reality of Christ's resurrection, then and now. St. Mary Magdalene and St. Thomas the Twin are the two protagonists the evangelist use, uses to touch our mind and our soul. Belief and unbelief personified. Not good and evil, I might add, but rather two sides of a faith coin. Male and female, optimist and skeptic, disciple and disciple. One is not better than the other. Indeed, both are apostles, if we follow St. Thomas Aquinas' description of Mary as Apollostorum Apollostola, or Apostle of the Apostles. Today our Gospel reading invites us to turn our reflections on St. Thomas the Twin. For many of us, as for many of the first century hearers of the Gospel, his doubts are our doubts. His unbelief, our unbelief. Unless I see, I will not believe. 
And this is not apostasy, but rather a natural human impulse to which we are all prone. Those of faith as much as those without faith. It is an internal move of the human spirit that even the apostles themselves experienced. St. John, the evangelist, portrays this so well. Paul Tillich, in his systematic theology, draws the dichotomy rather between unbelief and unfaith. Unbelief and unfaith. And he writes, if there were such a word as unfaith, it should be used instead of the word unbelief. Unbelief, he continues, is the disruption of human cognitive participation in God. It should not be called the denial of God. Ultimately, it's not our cognitive participation in God, our belief or unbelief, which brings about salvation or equally hinders it. Thomas' unbelief is not a sin. It is in fact the very means by which he comes to make one of the greatest statements of faith. When the risen Christ appears a second time to the disciples in the locked house, Thomas is finally given the gift of sight and touch that he asked for. His unbelief is powerfully transformed into belief. My Lord and my God, he proclaims. Perhaps those are our words or have been our experience also. I have to confess that I've been through times of unbelief, recently especially. The current pandemic has taken so many of us, I suspect, into places where our, to quote Tillich, cognitive participation in God has been severely disrupted. Dear God has certainly been my prayer. How can you allow the church doors to be shut on a Sunday or on Easter day? Throughout my faith journey, in times of crisis, I have to confess also, in times of grief, of hurt, of division, I have found myself in that Thomistic place of unbelief. Where is the promise of God? Is this really God's will? It is so dark, so empty, it feels so meaningless at times. Where is the path to reconciliation within myself, with my neighbour, with my God even? There are times that I cannot see, with Thomas that I ask to be able to touch, to feel, to experience what has vanished, what has gone, the empty. Show me God is my prayer. And the answer to this existential faith angst, it lies not in the force of self-will, not in legalism of any kind, saying my prayers in exactly the right way, doing exactly what God would have me do according to whatever source or authority I may choose. Neither is it in the force of asceticism. If I beat myself up enough, God will surely hear me. 
if I fast, if I pray enough, if I really push my spiritual disciplines, God will surely hear me. Neither is it even in the force of, of mysticism, the belief in God's presence. If I believe it enough, God will appear, God will be there. The answers lie in none of these places. These disciplines, legalism, asceticism, mysticism, they all contain good, truth, reality. But in themselves they cannot save. In themselves they cannot produce God at will. Self salvation is not true salvation. Again, turning to Tillich, he writes on this very point, for Augustine, the union between God and humanity is re-established only by the mystical powers of grace. Through the mediation of the church and its sacraments. Grace, Augustine writes, as the infusion of love is the power which overcomes estrangement. Grace, as the infusion of love is the power which overcomes estrangement. In these challenging times, these Thomistic times of unbelief, perhaps, it is only the infusion of love that can truly heal and save. Sacred Easter home altars that are popped up in the homes of the faithful are part of that infusion. The innumerable heart felt. How are you? Phone calls, Zoom conversations, and emails are part of that infusion of love. The self-sacrificial distribution of meals to the homeless and the suddenly employed. No, they don't force God's hand, but they are part of that infusion of God's love. The carefully chosen thought from the for the day from so many of our parishioners that are being posted at the moment. That infusion of love. The irrepressible cycle of worship, devotion and song through which we now reach out to one another and to God in new ways through fiber optic cable and Wi-Fi rather than in person. These two are something of that infusion in love. Belief and unbelief. Mary Magdalene and Thomas the Twin. Two sides of the apostolic faith coin. Two sides of resurrection truth. Two human realities bound together in love, infused in love. George Herbert captures this synthesis, this Easter truth, so well in a poem that I'm sure you too know so well. Love, number three, by George Herbert. Love made me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here, Love said, you shall be he. 
I, the unkind, ungrateful? Ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look off thee. Love took my hand, and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, said love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit. 